to continue our Easter celebration. My name is Werner Vos. I am the pastoral psychologist at our Father Lutheran Church. Been there for 26 years. Been in the Denver area for over 50. So, hey, I'm old. But hey, I am ever anew in the Lord. So here we go. Um, our theme for the day is going to be Forgiveness, again. And that's why Jesus came and greeted his disciples at the evening of Easter day. Uh, forgiveness again. I want to invite you to join me uh, in the adult Bible class. It's about forgiveness. Um, there's so much resentment hatred in this culture right now, uh, it's important to realize that resentment and hatred does not have to rule, but that forgiveness can indeed take root amongst the people of God and offer an alternative to God's people and to the denizens of this world. So uh, it's called Good and Angry, Understanding, Appreciating, and Using Well What Was Once Considered a Deadly Sin. So, got some time. Meet me over there, and we'll continue what we do in the worship this morning at 8. Let's begin by sharing the peace of the Lord. May the Lord's peace, his Easter peace, be with you always. Greetings. Peace of the Lord be with you. Lord's peace. Peace of the Lord. Lord's peace be with you. Peace of the Lord. Lord's peace. Oh, we did that already. We're two times as good. <laughs> Lord's peace be with you. Peace of the Lord.
worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not practice the truth. But, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. His name's Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may, by your grace, confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
congregation is seated as we listen to the lessons for this weekend. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Acts. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm of the day is Psalm 148. We'll read it responsibly. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise, Praise the Lord from the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all his shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens. And you are the above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. Praise the Lord from the earth. Fire and hail, snow and mist, mountains and all hills, beasts and livestock, kings of the earth and all peoples, young men and maidens together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above He has raised up a horn of salvation for his people. Praise for all his saints. The people of Israel are near to him. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle reading is from the book of 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things, so that our joy may be complete." This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. God. 
gospel is written in the gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter, we begin with verse 19. I read from the Kingdom New Testament. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Judeans. Jesus came and stood in the middle of them. Peace be with you, he said. With these words, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the master. Peace be with you, Jesus said to them again. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. With that, he breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you retain anyone's sins, they are retained. One of the twelve, Thomas, also known as Didymus, the twin, wasn't with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples spoke to him. We've seen the master, they said. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, replied Thomas, and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut. Jesus came and stood in the middle of them. Peace be with you, he said. And then he addressed Thomas. Bring your finger here, he said, and inspect my hands. Bring your hand here and put it into my side. Don't be faithless. Just believe. My Lord, replied Thomas, and my God. Is it because you've seen me that you believe, replied Jesus? God's richest blessing on people who don't see and yet believe. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that the Messiah, the Son of God, is none other than Jesus, and that with this faith you may have life in his name. Here ends the Gospel.
grace, mercy, and peace be to all of us from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus. I've chosen to shorten the Gospel reading a bit today to focus on the precise interaction of the risen Jesus and the remnants of his inner core 12 disciples, who for today's sermon were missing Judas for obvious reasons and Thomas for reasons unstated. Why do this, you may ask? Because in my experience, there's plenty of godly stuff to deal with in verses 19 to 23 for one sermon anyway, without getting into that Thomas section in verses 24 to 31, which has been worked and reworked and reworked, and in my opinion, at Thomas's expense some of the time. After all, he only wanted the same experience that the other disciples already had when he had been absent. Okay, so let's have it, shall we? I'm going to read the first five verses of the Gospel reading. Later on, on that day, that Easter day, the disciples had gathered together, but fearful of the Judeans, had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. And then he showed them his hands and side. The disciples, seeing the master with their own eyes, were exuberant. Jesus repeated the greeting, Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And then he took a deep breath, and breathed on them. He breathed into them, received the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive those sins, they'll still be there. Here ends the basis for my message this morning. Here's a news flash for you. A small group of Jesus' disciples are hunkered down here at their favorite gathering place following the crucifixion of Jesus. Former advocates of the abruptly imploded Christ cause are low in spirit, to put it biblically. The Jesus movement, which began with great promise in the north, in Galilee, apparently has been defeated. Now this soundbite of Easter evening is an appropriate description for this second weekend of Easter, which has historically been dubbed Low Weekend by the Church. There aren't nearly as many of us here gathered compared to the worship spectaculars that were offered last weekend here and throughout the world. The joy and the enthusiasm of those pristine days are drastically diminished. Salvation mania is no more a reality has settled in. I suppose that we are much like those first disciples huddled together on Easter Eve. Of course, <laughs> they didn't know Directly it was Easter yet, at least not firsthand. There had been some reports of an empty tomb, but for them, for the most part, it was still Friday when darkness, deep darkness, overcame light. I imagine that there was a lot of blaming going around. Peter, for one, felt lousy after all his grand declarations of fidelity and courage. What did these pious platitudes mean when the going got rough? Huh? He, the rock, crumbled. And like the other, ran away when the soldier showed up. Moreover, it wasn't only Judas who betrayed the master. They all had buckled into their fear and cowardice when it came to crunch time for Jesus. And yet, 
there's this amazing thing that happened to them in their gloom and doom. The risen one made an Easter appearance. Yes, to this paltry, pitiful pack of failures. He came through their locked doors, eagerly wanting to reconnect with the very ones who had so terribly failed him. They couldn't believe it. These disciples who had been with Jesus every step of the way prior to the crucifixion could not fathom that it was really Jesus until the risen one pointed out his wounds for them to see. Then, and only then, did their frozen fear begin to thaw. Their ginormous guilt begin to yield, and their blustery blaming begin to fade. Their deep-seated gloom started to lift, to elevate. But that wasn't the end of the encounter, not by a long shot. The Lord hosted a mini Pentecost. He breathed on them. He breathed into them new life, just like Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, had breathed the human race into being in the second creation account that's located in Genesis chapter 2. It was an amazing moment. It calls out to you and me for further reflection this day. Let's go over this again. What was it that the risen Lord said to them that started all this good stuff? Shalom Alechem. Peace be to you. Inherent in that very short greeting was a potent message I'm back with you, despite your failures. I want to be with you now more than ever before. I forgive you, and I will empower you with new life so that the Father's mission can move forward. Imagine how Jesus' first words of forgiveness might have been received by those disciples. Remember, they were all bunched up because of fear. Fear does ugly, awful things, doesn't it? Yes, they wondered what would be next for them. They were spooked that the soldiers and the collaborators who had put Jesus to death might at that very moment be hunting for them. But maybe after Jesus appeared out of nowhere, they were also just a little unsettled, a little bit scared of Jesus who shows up just like that, where their doors are locked and windows are sealed? <laughs> what if the first words the risen one spoke were the opposite of shalom? What if his words had taken the form of pointed questions such as, all right, where were you cowards? After all I did for you, what did you do for me in my hour of need when I needed you most? You call yourselves disciples? <laughs> Where were you with friends like you? Who needs enemies? But Jesus didn't call them out, didn't get revenge, although they deserved both. They were all, every one of them, betrayers of Jesus in one way or another. They all refused to believe what he said. They all declined to obey his commands. They all miserably failed to follow him as he asked over and over again. Yet, all of the Gospels agree that these were the ones to whom Jesus returned. <laughs> he didn't trade them, dump them off for a whole new team. The first thing he said was peace, shalom, wellness, goodness, fulfillment, be yours. He stilled their initial dread of what he might say or do to them by offering them pardon and a godly peace. Then <laughs> he repeated it a second time for good measure. They needed Jesus' forgiveness and needed to forgive each other. Yes, indeed. Again, you can imagine all 
the discord and the blaming that must have been circulating throughout the group. You can imagine how it might have been. If you have ever been a member of a congregation in trouble, a church fighting for its life, a church surviving moral failure, a church in a major life transition, then uh, you'll know just how easy it is to scapegoat one another for all the problems that erupt under those circumstances. Wise old preacher told me once, Werner, when the church isn't fighting the world with Jesus, then the church turns in upon itself and members turn to devour one another. It was to these people caught in their own despair, their own guilt and shame and blame, that Jesus pronounced peace. He forgave them. Their relationship with the Lord was restarted only by Jesus' act of forgiveness. Their relationship with him was restored and enriched in his pouring out of divine spirit so that they might move on and move out for God. Of course, forgiveness was at the heart of Jesus' ministry. I'm reminded of all of those times when Jesus walked up to people and one of the first things that he said to them was, hey, hey, your sins are forgiven. Huh? Often these folks hadn't even mentioned sin or the need for forgiveness. We almost expect some of them to say, who said anything about sin? Who said that I had stuff that needed forgiving in the first place? I, I was just sick, or, or I was bored, or I was stuck in a life pattern, or I was just hurting too badly. Thoughts of sin and forgiveness never crossed my mind. I'm a practical person, you see. I wasn't thinking theologically. Nevertheless, Jesus just kept on announcing extravagant, preemptive forgiveness. Have you noticed that most of the people whom he forgave in his ministry didn't repent first? Or said that they were sorry first, and then they got forgiveness. No, they got forgiveness, then they could do that godly stuff. Forgiveness was the power that allowed them to heal and to grow. Jesus forgave them first. It's powerful, more powerful than we give it credit for. And Jesus commands us to be forgivers as well. Jesus tells us that we are to love even enemies. When he taught us the Our Father, he really didn't direct us to bring all of our aches and pains and needs to God in prayer. If you do only that, it's gimme, 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 and prayer can become a gimme gimmick. Rather, he spoke of a pre-existing forgiveness at the ready for us. In the same breath, he urged us to forgive those who betray and who wrong us. On Easter evening, Jesus' first action was to, to return to his uh, disciples. The second was that he greeted them with peace. He therefore forgave his opponents, those acting like enemies who happened to also be his students and his friends. He forgave them because he knew that there was absolutely no way for them to be his disciples for the sake of the Father without a constant state of grace being behind them, being with them, and going out in front of them. He forgave them because forgiveness, you see, is the very heart of God, the very nature of the divine one. It all seems quite clear. If you and I, if we want to be disciples of Jesus, if we're going to be faithful and obedient to follow him, then we sure better become used to receiving and dishing out an awful lot of forgiveness. Opportunities to need a God who forgives us and helps us to forgive others generously will be many. Be 
because fallen human nature will still make its ugly presence known. Have you noticed? Illustration. In the 1919 massacre of Armenian peoples by the neighboring Turks, over a million people were murdered. Many stories of intense suffering and tragedy abound from that time, but among them stand stories of unbelievable courage, like the following one that I'm going to give you, that Professor David Augsburger shares in his book, The New Freedom of Forgiveness. He says, a militant unit attacked a village of Armenian Christians, killing all adults, all males and all small children, taking only the young women as hostages. An officer raiding a home shot the parents, gave the daughters to his soldiers, but kept the beautiful oldest daughter for himself. Of course he would do that. For months, until he found another one who pleased him better and more. She was forced into servitude and sexual abuse. At last, she pushed her way out of his house, and she escaped from the military camp and slowly, gradually, courageously rebuilt her life, ultimately completing training as a nurse. One night, while on duty in a Turkish hospital, she was caring for a desperately ill patient in the ICU, and she recognized the face behind the bandages. It was her former captor and perp, the murderer of her parents. He was comatose and without constant care he would never have survived. A long and difficult convalescence followed with the patient way too ill to be aware of his surroundings at first or those giving him proper care. One day, as the horribly wounded one was finally awakening to the reality around him, the Turkish doctor said, hey, you, you're so fortunate. You had no idea. Had it not been for the devoted care of this nurse, you would never have made it. You would be a dead man. That former officer looked long and hard at the nurse, and he said, I wanted for the last three days to ask you, have we met before? Yes, she replied, we have. Why didn't you just let me die when you had the chance? You would have had every right to kill me, would you not? She said, no. No, I would not, because I am a follower of him who said, love your enemies, do good to those who despitefully use you and persecute you. The one who proved it in the way that he died and the way that he restored his disciples after resurrection. May we follow her example, who followed the example of Jesus in the name of our Heavenly Father, who through the one and only Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, forgives, restores, sends, and blesses us. Not only at Easter, but all the time. Amen. We continue our worship by speaking together our confession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we gather our tithes and offerings. stand for the prayer of the church. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, I ask you to respond as a congregation with hear our prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, your son is the firstborn from the dead. In him, we have been reborn into a new and living hope. Nurture us with the pure milk of your word and that we may grow to maturity of faith and have everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant to those ordained for your service the gift of the Holy Spirit, wisdom that comes down from above, and grace to fulfill faithfully their holy calling where you have placed them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. As your people are united in the common life and love of our Savior, grant that we would share that life and love with those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Build up the households of your people, that your holy children begotten in baptism may grow in your grace and share together in your forgiveness and life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have instituted authorities to carry out your justice. Bless all who make, administer, and judge the laws of our land. Give them wisdom, integrity, and honor to serve according to your good will. Lord, in your mercy. As your son's wounds brought gladness and peace to the troubled disciples, Give your presence and comfort to the troubled in our midst, especially God's garden orphanage, survivors and victims, families from the Baltimore Bridge collapse and terrorist attack in Moscow. Haiti, Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia. Elise, Zach, Stan, Jerry, Cindy, Barbara, Anna, Dakota, Gary, Jan, Stanley, Sharon, Doug, Julie, Martin, Sarah, Linda, Katie, Jerry, Valerie, Martin, Tara, Dan, Deb, 
Tammy, John, Kim, Steve, Sally, Jonathan, Jeremy, Jeff, Luke, and Linda. Comfort also those who weep, especially the family of Ronald Arthur Wenzel. With the blessed joy of Easter morning, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those celebrating births, birthdays, and anniversaries, especially for Cindy Bober, Cheryl Grothy, Ken Johnson, Mimi, Martin, Jeff, and Sean Lowell, and Stan and Marcy Poor, that their joy would be our joy and that they would be blessed by another year of God's providence and grace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of your indescribable grace, for the sake of your Son, you have given us the Holy Gospel and instituted the Blessed Sacrament that through them we may have comfort and the forgiveness of sin. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may heartily believe your word, and through the holy sacraments establish our faith day by day, until at last we obtain eternal salvation through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray the prayer with which our Lord privileged us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his great favor and grant you his peace and power. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated. I believe uh, some announcements may be forthcoming. <clears throat> I have three short announcements. The first is that uh, Pastor Chris returns from vacation tomorrow, so you can reach out to him if you have any, any needs there. The second is that um, the Bible class led by Tim Hutchison is meeting at 9.30 over in room one in this building. And then lastly, on Friday, Pastor Chris is leading a group to go down to the Capitol uh, in the, um, the March for Life rally. Um, and there's some information in the starlight there about uh, carpooling and whatnot here from Epiphany in the morning and then heading downtown. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. We conclude our worship by singing the closing hymn.